Paul identifies himself as the author. And so notice how he identifies himself in, in, with, with two, in two ways. This is the description here. He's, he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. And this is done, um, this is the means. And he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now let's talk for a second. Anyone answer the question, what, is, what, what does apostle mean? Messenger, excellent. Now, what, when, when someone speaks as a messenger, do they have their own authority? Yes or no? So I want to I want to really accent this because today there's a movement even in the in the U.S. to talk about oh we should use the word Paul, we should use the word Paul, and and I will reference Paul in in our discussions. But I want to be very clear, Paul is not an authority to himself, and and his apostleship does not convey his personal authority like like a pastor or someone else. He is, he, is, he is in this special position where he is literally conveying and, and maintaining the authority of, of Jesus Christ himself. So that's why, I, you know, some people will use the term apostle to mention to people nowadays, but I, I really, I don't think we should be using that because this Paul, Paul communicated his message, his message with unique authority that no one in the church has today. Is everyone tracking there with me? There is this special unique authority, and this authority includes the writing of scripture and commanding actions. And you actually see this in other places where Paul will say, I give this not as a command of the Lord, but my, it's, this is my opinion. He'll actually say that. He does that in Corinthians. He does that in several places, okay? And so this is a, a, a unique position. And so the reason why I'm highlighting this is that Paul is going to say some very strong things about our salvation in verses 3 to 14, okay? And people will minimize that because of their own view of what salvation should be, their own view of what, how God should love. And I really want to accent this, is that what Paul is saying, this is not, this is, um, you have to wrestle with what Paul is saying as carrying the very authority of Jesus Christ himself. And it's not just Jesus Christ. The, the means by this is in fact, so, so Paul is an apostle as a messenger, it's be, of course, it's beyond. It's beyond the, the writing of the letter. But we're accenting that authority, particularly because in, this, in our context, people do not give that level of authority to Paul. Are, are you tracking with me there? So it's not to say that only in the writing of the letter. I mean, Paul could give, an, a, could give a command. Whoever writes on behalf of Paul, the dictation, it's Paul and ultimately Jesus, yeah. So we don't want to, we don't, what, what I'm trying to get at is we don't want to split between an amanuensis, Paul, or Christ. These are the words of Christ. This is the, the will of God, the words of Christ. So what I want us to see here is that this, the accent is on this. Do not be deceived by, do not be deceived by the fact that Paul, a, a, a man is writing this. The, the, the content, the content's focus is here. So people who just refer to, they just refer to the epistle to the Ephesians as the word of God, that's appropriate. That's, that's very much appropriate. We don't have to refer to Paul. Paul said this. Um, yeah, we don't have to refer to that. It's, 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 it's the word of, the, Christ says this, God says this, the, the, the Father says this. We would want to say there's two authors, divine and human. So historically, we want to say there's two authors divine and human. and human but the ultimate ultimately of course divine okay 
But we do want to acknowledge the human component. Paul right. will insert his style and even some of his commentary, but he says it's not from the Lord, it's from me. So there is a human author. So we, I, we wouldn't want to say writer, we would want to say two authors, but the accent, of course, is on, is on the divine. And when we're speaking about authority, we would say, we, we talk about biblical authority as well. So the authority is, there is, this is not Paul, again, not Paul's authority. So, so maybe the authorship is a little bit confusing. We're not saying authorship in authority, but only authorship in, who, in, the, in the writing. Does that make sense, Henry? And that, that's a good question to kind of tease this out. We do ultimately, what I'm trying to get out among the competent is there's no excuse. You can't say, oh, that's just Paul. You know, I prefer James in this, or I prefer Peter in this. You, you can't get away with that. You can't go. It, 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 if you're going to go at that, at that, in that area, that, 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 that's um, inappropriate. Okay. Um, let's move on. Let, let's move on here. So we have, we have next, we have the, uh, the audience or the recipients, we can say the recipients here. And this is the saints. So who are these saints? Anyone is familiar with this word saint? Saint literally means holy. And what does holy mean, Jesus? Set apart. Who was set apart? Who was holy? The people the of Israel. The, they were a holy nation, Diba. And we actually see in we actually see this in in First Peter, chapter two, verses one to nine, one to eleven, you have Peter calling the church a holy nation. Literally, the quote. This quote is from Exodus nineteen. You could say to the holy ones, and actually, in some translations, I actually I to the holy ones. To the holy nation, to the do you see what I'm saying? So, so there seems to be looking at First Peter as well. Paul is identifying these people in Ephesus as as in the same way that Israel was identified. People will say, "Well, no, there are two groups." But let's 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 ask that question because maybe Ephesians two and three is going to tell us how these two groups are related. Okay. So let's think about that because it is so interesting that Paul introduces the believers in Ephesus as holy ones, and then he is going to discuss the relationship with the the relationship with the the with Israel in Ephesians two to three. Okay. So this introduction is really getting us, um, Paul's going to explain that, okay? Maybe this will change your perspective on our relationship with Israel in some way, um, not minimizing them as a people or as an, an, an ethnic group, but really understanding the relationship there. So they're holy ones, and what else are they? They are the ones who are, so they are number one, they're in Ephesus, so it's a specific location. And they are faithful. They're set apart and they are faithful. Think about that for a second. This describes yeah. their character. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jesus. Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking that maybe these holy ones or the saints is not only referred to the, to the Jews, maybe, but maybe it includes the Gentiles who are a believer Gentiles who yeah, are so, faithful, I think. Yeah, so, so, so let's think about... Let's, that's a great observation. Let's think about Jew and Gentile. I think this also kind of puts us in the context that Paul describes them as not only set apart, but as being faithful. Does that describe us as a church? Does your church is your church described as faithful? Are, are the people that surround you in your local church context, would someone look from the outside and say, yes, you guys are faithful? That's something to think about. It's something to think about. Notice this. They are faithful, though, 
And then there's this key word here, this key phrase, in Christ Jesus. So what I'm going to put here is in the sphere, in the realm of. Now, what, what jumps out at you? What jumps out at you? So we, 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 we talked about here how Israel is referred to as a holy nation, right? They're going to talk about that in two and three. What jumps out? What's a, what's a Jewish term in besides saints? What's a Jewish term in this part B? May the eyes of our heart be open. <laughs> Christ is not Christ. This word Christ, is this not a Jewish term? Mangakapatid? So again, looking at this debate, the believers in Ephesus, Paul, Paul, who is an apostle of Messiah, Paul's a Jew. He's an apostle of the Messiah, the anointed one. He's described, he describes the believers in Ephesus as holy ones, which is how the, Israel, the nation of Israel is described. They are a holy, particular people set apart for God. And he describes them as in Christ Jesus. Now, later we're going to see that this describes, this is a phrase that Paul will always use to describe union. This is a theological doctrine. Union with Christ. So, so meaning to say that we are in intense relationship in the closest relationship possible with with christ for those of you who are familiar with ephesians how will how will paul later describe this in uh, ephesians it's marriage can you ever annul a marriage in god's in god's eyes no from the beginning it was not so and so this is irrevocable irrevocable. So I want us to think about this for a second. The saints, the holy ones, are in the closest relationship with the Messiah, with the Jewish Messiah. So again, do we view scripture, do we view our relationship with the Old Testament as one of discontinuity or continuity? Is there agreement or, or dissimilarity? And, and we have to say, Man, it's very close. It's very close. Now, of course, we have to tweak it out. We're not saying that we are just Israel of the Old Testament. We're under the Old Covenant. We're not saying that. But what we are saying is that in this era of fulfillment, the church is, is, is in the Jewish Messiah, and the church is called Holy Ones. And so this really should set the table for how we should view our relationship with the promises of the Old Testament, with the promised one of the Old Testament. And, and we should really think about Old Testament in, in continuity. What, what's the purpose, or what's the reason why Paul wrote uh, this uh, letter to the Ephesus? Is, is there in any problem or an issue with Ephesus? Because uh, this mention here, they are already uh, 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 faithful. So I'm just wondering if why Paul wrote this letter to them. Yeah. At the end of the day, Paul doesn't say explicitly, like, I'm writing this specifically for this. He says that with Romans, right? He says, why did I write this? Because I want to have fruit among you, okay, as I do with the rest of the Jews. So, so Paul is very clear in, in Romans. Here, not as clear. The, my answer to that would be, in his prayer, his prayer is that they would know what has happened to them, because most of them are Gentiles. And so what I would say is that... Um, if you, uh, if you read the, the, the background handout that I sent you, they were coming from a pluralistic culture with multiple deities. Their worldview was, was, uh, was vastly different. There was a lot of occult and magic going on in Ephesus. You can read that in Acts. Um, there was also this heavily worship of Diana, and she was a fertility god. So there's a lot of sexual corruption going on. That's their context, okay? And so Paul is 
number one, writing these Gentiles and saying, you've chosen, you've chosen to believe in the Messiah, in Christ, God's, God's anointed one. What has happened in Christ? What is the big picture? This is the big worldview. This is the, the revelation of knowledge that you need to have your eyes open to, okay? And so let me just briefly read for you. Um, we're going to discuss this in, in several weeks, but Paul, Paul prays a prayer of thanksgiving in verse 16, Ephesians 1, 16. And then he says, remembering in my prayers that, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you, you may know what is the hope to which you've called, what are the riches of the glorious inheritance, and what is the immeasurable power that is, that is toward us who believe. So, he, so I would say that they need to understand what has been given to them. That's, what, that's what the, the prayer that he has. And then how do, how do you live that out in daily life? Paul, Paul wants to strengthen them. And for all of us, when you understand what has been done for you, that is a huge basis to then do even better job or even to, to, to live in unity. So I would say that they are faithful. They are trying to live out their faith, but they're not fully mature. And so he's trying to bring them because in Ephesians 4, he, his prayer is that they would reach the full stature of maturity. <laughs> So, so they're on the way. And so he's trying to really bring that out. And so I think, Jesus, as you read Ephesians, you can really imagine what they're struggling with. Maybe there's some issues with the Jews. There's issues between Jews and Gentiles. And so as we read, we can imagine what's going on. At the end of the day, we don't know precisely. But I, but I think that the content really guides us on, on their, their, their needs. And I'm going to say this too, Jesus, that in our churches, I think that there is a lot of lack of knowledge. And, and, and I think that not that knowledge, knowledge alone puffs up, but if we have a, a better knowledge of what has been done for us, that, that is a motivation. That is a motivation to, to live a holy life. If we have an, a knowledge that we're in a spiritual warfare, that gives us expectations when we go outside on how we're going to live. Like we're not, we're expecting to, to, to fight this spiritual battle. If we don't know about it, we, we're like surprised, like when all these bad things happen, happen to us. Verse two, verse two, okay? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a salutation here. And there's two things that are given to them. There is this, there's the object of grace. There's the object of peace. And this is being given to the, the object of the people. So let's take a moment first and, and reflect upon this. Um, and where is this coming from? It's coming from number one it's coming from christ and who else is it coming from from the father god our father and lord yeah. jesus christ so number one this this suggests a a equality here between the two right mm -hmm. so 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 this gets to the background a background mm -hmm. issue a background issue here is is we could talk about the divinity. Yeah, so for sure we have the humanity of Christ, but here, divinity of, of Jesus, inequality with the Father. This is a background. So this alone does not prove, but it strongly suggests. Okay, so God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, looking at this name here, this is the, the king of the universe, the king of creation, Yahweh. So notice how now 
the father is not called Yahweh, but Jesus fulfills that role. Does everyone see that? Um, we can discuss, we can discuss this, this later, but that's what Lord signifies um, here. And so that's the first part of Jesus's name. The second part, what is what does Jesus literally mean? Anyone remember what Jesus literally means? Yahweh saves. So again, Jesus is, these names are divine names that are being given to him. And then of course, what is Christ? We said it, it's Messiah. But what does that mean? What does that mean specifically? Give me, give me the specific, what does Messiah mean? Anointed. Anointed yeah, one. Anointed. In contrast, now God is identified as the Father. So this is the, the, the revelation of who God is to us as our Father, as our Father. Revelation as our Father. Um, now, uh, grace and peace. What, what does grace? What does grace signify? What does grace signify to us? Anyone? You define grace for me. Someone defines grace. Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. So, uh, and, and and what about what about peace? Reconciled with God. Reconciled with God. <laughs> yeah, you have uh, recon uh, reconciliation. What's the what's the polar opposite? What is the opposite of peace? War or wrath? So so think about this that Paul's going to explain. Prior to their conversion, Paul is going to say in chapter two that they were children of wrath. Let me read Ephesians chapter two, Ephesians chapter two. You were, you were the sons of disobedience following the prince of the power of the air. You were by nature children of wrath. So think about this. The Gentiles were under the wrath of God. They were separated. Ephesians two, we'll talk about them being alienated. And now Paul is saying grace to you unmerited favor to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the universe. You are at peace with the God of the universe. We gloss over these introductions. You know, it's like, okay, let's get to, let's get to the, the content. Think about how deep, how deep Grace to you and peace. So if I'm going to write, now this salutation is very concise, but if I was to write this in my own words, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give to you grace and peace. Paul is the ambassador. Paul is the apostle the messenger giving this to them we can preach that message but we can preach this message here on the authority of christ jesus and the will of god the rulers of the universe grace and peace are with you think about that if i was if I was preaching verses one, I could preach verses one and two. You could have, you could have this as the first major point. Point number one, point number two, and then A is who the author is and B are the recipients, right? And then point number two can be the source, object, grace and peace, right? I, I want us to try to see here how we could even preach just verses one and two. Looking at the big ideas, the big idea could be, the big idea could, could, could be here and here. 
and then subpoints. Okay, is everyone tracking? Is, is everyone kind of making sense with what I'm saying here? And then your whole sermon would be explaining upon what an apostle is, the authority of Christ Jesus. There's so much content there. God's will that cannot be revoked. You could go to other places in Ephesians to describe this. But the, the main idea is on the basis, you could say something like this, on the basis of Christ's authority and the will of God, grace and peace be to you. Something like that. You know, we will say, how are you doing? I'm blessed, right? And so people will always say it and, and they will almost, the word becomes small, diba? the words become small. And, and for sure, it's a practice. It's a practice beyond here. At the same time, I do think there's deep significance. And even though other people would you other people would minimize words, they will, they will, you know, even take words in vain, right? God bless you. When someone sneezes, God bless you. It's not, it's just a word that's being said. Absolutely. So even though people will minimize what what I don't think Paul was minimizing, even though all his letters are like this, there is such such deep significance, and Paul is not minimizing. Go go ahead, Kaya. Go ahead. Oh, Pastor Dave, I was thinking because uh, it was the this uh, Pastor uh, the one who said that grace is a practice of the Jews and peace yeah. among the Gentiles. I think it's because oh, okay. Greece was okay. given to the Jews because they had unmerited favor. Well, the Gentiles, it's peace because they are children of wrath. I mean, you yeah. know, it's okay. I see. What I, you're I, saying. Think, I, see what I think. I think there's. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. No, there could be some truth to that. I guess. I guess the. Yeah, because he always uses that in the introduction. So, like, even to Timothy, he will say grace, peace, and mercy. In the pastoral, and it's just to Timothy, and so he Timothy's a Jew, but he gets all three. So, yeah, it, that could be it, it. Could be pastor teaching. I don't want to minimize that. Um, regardless, both are for both, <laughs> right? So yeah, so it could be R regardless of whether grace was focused on the Jews and peace is for the Gentiles. We need each, right? As a believer, I need grace and peace. As a believer, we need grace and peace because. Even you can be at peace with someone, but not have their unmerited favor. Diba? We want both to be at peace with the Lord of the universe and to be in his favor. That's the best, the best of the best. Yeah. I'm reading, uh, I'm sitting e uh, ESV and King James, you know? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Verse two. Verse two. If I if we look on on, on the text of verse uh, King James version for grace uh, for verse two, grace be to you, comma, yeah. and peace, comma, from God our Father, comma, yeah. from the Lord Jesus Christ. I do think there's an accent on the grace part. So when you look in the Greek, grace to you, like that's in Paul's mind. The focus is upon grace, unmerited favor. And then he adds, of course, and peace. And so I do think, I do think grace is really on his mind. And actually, this is one of the what the, the questions in the breakout session is that is that throughout Ephesians 1, uh, 3 to 14, grace is accented. <laughs> so I do think that grace is fundamentally on Paul's mind. That's why he says grace to you. And of course, he includes peace. Because he will discuss how we're no longer under the wrath of God. We now have his peace. But grace is really accented. The glorious grace. The riches of his grace. So that unmerited favor is so, so powerful, really. It's so powerful. This would be an excellent sermon to preach. And, and, and the emphasis here would be upon those who are in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. You have the assurance because Paul is the ambassador of the Messiah through the will of God. Get this. Look at the will. The will of God and his choosing. When does that occur? In time or before time? Question for next week. Think about that. Write it down. When, when has God determined this? When has God willed this? The answer is in verses 3 to, 3 to 14. 